Cool. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have Michael Clegg with us, um, kind of talk about how how to stand out uh, when you're looking for a job. So uh, I'll turn it over to him. If you guys have questions throughout, please feel free to type them in the chat box. If you're watching on Facebook, you can also type them in the comments and I'll make sure that uh, we get those answered for you as quickly as possible. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Rocking my Radford gear today. Uh, look, appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, I, I recognize right now uh, times are tough for some people and it, it is very important to understand how to navigate in this new world. I mean, if you looked at the data this morning, I think uh, the, the second quarter data is the worst that we have had since 1947, unofficially. Um, so things are tough, and, and, and I want to provide you with information and data to help you navigate. And, uh, you know, three decades of talent management, right, you know, that certainly makes me feel and sound old. But the thing about doing what I do and, and others that are in the recruiting industry is we are the tip of the spear. And so we get to see things. Usually, uh, we didn't see this coming with COVID, but we get to see things before they happen. And if I'm going to give you a little bit of hope at, at just my organization alone, July is the best month that we've had in the entire 2020, which is great. Um, and it's important to understand that things are recovering. People are going back to work. People are getting hired. Companies are still coming to us asking for talent. So as I said, initially, it's important to understand the world that we live in and how to navigate through the uncertainty, uh, and more importantly, how do you stand out in a world where automation is, one, it's here to stay, two, it's an accelerating at an alarming pace, uh, alarming for me because uh, I, I do get, uh, I mean, let me just give you an example. My wife does not allow me uh, or doesn't like for me to go grocery shopping. I take too long, I bring the wrong stuff back, now there's Instacart, right? Now I can just pull up in the line, get the groceries, and I can feel like a great husband, and, and uh, I went grocery shopping for my wife. I mean, think about it. Amazon bought Whole Foods. You know, I saw that, I'm like, it doesn't fit, but it's all about the automation, right? Everything that we do, including getting a job, is now involved in automation. So it's important to understand that when you go into your job search, it's, it's not any different. I mean, think about this. You could be sitting in uh, your house, your home, your apartment, uh, in your pajamas watching this. You could apply for jobs in your pajamas, right? So, so automation is allowing so many great things, but it also there are some things that come uh, with that. So first and foremost, I'm going to hit a couple of questions that I get almost daily. Um, should I have multiple versions of my resume? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, the, the reason for that is, and, and we'll talk more in depth about that, is you have to have a resume that is keywords driven. You have to have a resume that is searchable uh, for people like myself, recruiters, to find you based on certain job descriptions. So yes, you should have multiple versions. Yes, you should have a different resume for every job that you apply to because you should tailor that resume specific to that particular job description. And I'll show you how to do that. The other one that I get quite frequently is how many years of experience should I have on my resume? Um, and what, what is the cutoff point? Most experts will say 10 to 15 years is, is the cutoff point. It's important to understand that uh, as an example, I get, but Clegg, you know, 1996, I had a great year. I was doing this. I was doing that. I, I don't want to not have that on my resume. Well, there's ways that you can still capture all the great things that you've done in your previous uh, years beyond the 10, 15 years. And that, that is on a case by case basis. And there's something that we just, we put together a section called more experience, which you can actually upload some of the things that you've done without showing the years on your resume. So so we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, when we talk about automation, it is important that we have to understand the applicant tracking system, which we call the ATS. And look, it's, it's everywhere. Two thirds of every company in the world, which 98% uh, of the Fortune 500 uh, have that. So 
where it's growing is in the small businesses, right? Automation is becoming, is, is creating affordability, right, in technology. So as the ATS, as the applicant tracking systems become more affordable, more and more small businesses are jumping on board because they're getting bombarded with resumes. And, and that is simply because, you know, it's, a, it's a, the unintended consequence of automation, right, is it is so easy to apply for a job. I mean, we could sit here and shotgun, you know, 20 resumes out to 20 different job descriptions um, right now in a matter of minutes, right? So, um, you know, th so there are some unintended consequences. Your resume is going to be seen by a computer or software. That's just the, the fact that we can't get away from before it ever is seen by a human being. And it's just something that we have to understand uh, that that's the world we live in. And now that you have that knowledge and understand that, it's important to know some of the data points around applying directly to organizations. Less than 5% actually get an opportunity by applying directly to an organization. Even worse, less than 2% of applicants actually get an interview, right? So you look at that and go, well, why in the world would I ever do that? Keep in mind, people are using one resume that's the one-stop shop for every single job that they're applying for, okay? It's important to understand that that is not what we're gonna do, right? You are going to tailor your resume to the job description, okay? And that's really important. And then last but not least, half, and this is from LinkedIn's data points, half of people get employed through referrals. As a personal reference, every single job that I have ever worked since college has been through a referral, been through someone that's in the organization or that knows someone in the organization 100% of my jobs until obviously uh, QWorks um, is, is, is been through a referral. And there are ways, we won't be able to get into the networking aspect today, but there are ways through LinkedIn, especially now during uh, times of COVID and lockdowns that you can still network with individuals. And we can talk about that offline at a different time. Just don't have time today, but there are certainly things that, that you can do in order to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to network still today. All right. So when to apply. All right. Glassdoor says you should be roughly 80 plus percent qualified in order to apply to a job. I'm a little different. I, I say it's 70 to 75 percent. The reason for that is, you know, when you apply directly to an organization, once again, an ATS is reviewing your resume and they will determine, the ATS will determine if you make the first cut, right? Are you making it to the next level? When you work with a recruiter, oftentimes we either found you or you found us, but you're working directly with a specific role. And also I have a direct relationship with the decision maker, the person that's gonna be making the hiring decision. So it, it enables me to sell some of the intangibles, some of the soft skills that honestly just don't go on resumes. So having that direct line of communication allows us to sell, you know, attitude and effort as an example, based on our conversations and experiences uh, and the relationship that I've built with candidates. Uh, th that's why my numbers are a little bit different. And this week alone, there was a, there was a actual letter uh, on LinkedIn's newsletter talking about ATSs. It's actually a pretty decent uh, article. I think it was Tuesday. But one of the things that's in this, and I'll read this, a human will eventually see them if you're a top candidate referencing your resume within an ATS. And, and, I, and I take some, uh, that's not accurate. It's a little bit misleading. If you're a top candidate, the ATS is gonna choose you the first time, right? You know, that's a no brainer. So I, I, people read this and go, oh, you know, well, eventually I'm just gonna continue to shotgun fire my resume. No, do not do that, okay? Tailor each resume and we'll talk more about that. Um, I just wanted to point that out because um, that, this newsletter got a lot of buzz this week and, and uh, you know, particularly this point. So I wanted to make sure. So let me show you what, uh, what it looks like to, uh, to have an ATS scorecard. So this is essentially a very generic scorecard. I took this from, um, from an organization that has, um, uh, that has uh, you know, a, a very generic field service role. So if you look in the, the upper right-hand corner where it has the job description, this is how the job is being scored. This is what the hiring manager is looking for. Manufacturing background is most important, 
right? It's a field service role. They want troubleshooting skills. They want someone with an engineering background. Well, on the left where you see resume, right? Where you got the X's, that means they have manufacturing nowhere on the resume. So one, they didn't pay attention to the job description. Um, two, uh, you know, you're immediately going to be disqualified. One, it's the highest rated uh, skill area must have a manufacturing background and you don't even have it on your resume. Uh, so, so this is clearly going to not enable you to get to the next level uh, to make that first cut, which is really what we're trying to. So I think it's important to see what a very uh, basic scorecard, obviously those with multiple skills can be much more detailed, uh, but this is just something to give you kind of a reference point. So how do we find the right fit? And that is as important, not only as a hiring manager or an organization, a company, I think it's also important for you as a candidate or a job seeker to find the right fit for you as well. So we're gonna talk some more about that. This is what I call pro tip, it's a word cloud. We'll jump into you know, really what, um, what a word cloud is. Some of you have probably seen this before. Um, they're not super technical. I'm not technical at all. Um, if I can do it, anyone can do it. But essentially, this is a way for you to help pull out keywords within a job description, within your resume, that allows your resume to be keyword driven and searchable, which both are, are, are very important. The larger the words, the more prevalent. Okay, so I took a very generic job description, which is, you know, you can see there's, this is an accountant job description. I took it off of a Fortune 500 company. This was actually a European role. Um, cut and paste, put it in a Word document. Microsoft Word has a, um, a plugin that's called the Pro Word Cloud, as you can see in the top right-hand corner. And that Pro Word Cloud allows you to build out, i.e. the Word Cloud. And so what I did was I take this, cut and paste it, put it in, look at the bottom right, click the blue button that says create a word cloud, and essentially this is what comes out, okay? Now, if you can tell, it's an accounting role, so inevitably accounting is gonna be the biggest, financial is gonna be the biggest words. So I can actually omit those words in the search so other words become more prevalent. Clearly, if it's an accounting role, you probably should have an accounting background. So we can omit those words, and then ultimately what ha happens is now you've got other words. The colors don't matter. It's the size of the words. Analyzing, experience, client, budget. These are all key terms that you need to make sure that if you don't have these on your resume and you can build a word cloud for your resume by cutting and pasting your resume in there. If the same large words, um, you're likely a pretty good fit. If they're not uh, similar words or the same words rather, uh, let's go ahead and, and, and let's move. Um, uh, let's move some of these words around that. Like you may have customer on your resume, but in the job description, as an example, they use the word client. Change the word customer on your resume to client. I'm not asking you to put fluff in your resume. I'm not asking you to lie on your resume. What I'm asking you to do is to tailor your resume to fit into the words that are being used in the job description. So really important keynote, very easy to do, uh, very, very simple. All right, so let's, let's build out the resume. First, your professional summary. Titles, skills, competencies. I still, to this day, see objectives. Please, 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 please. If you don't get anything from this today, take this. Do not put objective on your resume. Think about it. An objective is what do you want and expect from your future employer? A professional summary is actually the value that you're going to bring to that client. So if you're a hiring manager, would you rather hire the person that's telling you the value that they're going to bring you and, and the organization? Or do you want the person that's telling you what they expect from you? Inevitably, it's about the value, right? So first and foremost, get the professional summary right. Your accomplishments is what I call the so what section. And, and this is where I still believe, and I love bullet points. Okay, I love quick, easy. The average resume is not reviewed longer than two minutes. That's after making the first cut. You have to understand in an ATS, hundreds of resumes you're competing against. So let's say they say, uh, give me, give me 30, 30 of the top resumes. Imagine having to go through 30 resumes. You can't spend more than a couple minutes on it. So the bullet points make it very easy to read, to scan which leads to number three, which is using numbers, okay? 
uh, there's plenty of data out there that states that numbers, the eyeballs, go directly to those on a piece of paper. So let's make sure that, that your resume has a ton of, of numbers and data because that is what is going to capture the attention of once your resume gets to a human, okay? Keywords and searchable, we'll, we'll move forward. This one is a big one because there are a lot of people out there that sell resume services, okay? We do it as well. But what I will not do is build out a resume that's fully graphic, creative, real flashy, aesthetically. You look at it and go, wow, this is great. The problem is if you're going to submit these to ATSs inside of organizations, they don't, it doesn't assimilate. It doesn't, it doesn't read those resumes well. Okay, because what happens is essentially you'll send your resume in and it automatically populates name, address, skills, keywords, et cetera, inside of the ATS. If you've got all of these graphics and pretty looking things, it doesn't translate well to the softwares. So you might spend, you know, thousands of dollars to get this great looking resume that never gets seen. So please, please, please keep it to a minimal. And, and one other thing, uh, we deal with a lot of European clients. Don't put a picture on your resume. Uh, very popular uh, in European nations, but here it, it brings up um, diversity issues, discrimination, uh, and a, a lot of organizations will automatically disqualify if there's a if there is a picture. So that's important. All right, now we got the resume. Let's talk about creating the first impression. And there's a couple things here that I think make a lot of sense that I want you to want you to, to, to carry away here. And first and foremost, stand up. Okay. Um, hopefully you can tell I'm not sitting down. I'm actually standing up. When you stand up, you have more energy. Your voice inflection is entirely different. When I'm actually on, on the phone with clients, I try to stand up, whether I'm using earbuds, my head headset, or even just on the speakerphone. I like to stand up because your energy level exudes. Clearly, and I did mention in a phone screen, if you're in a face-to-face, -face, you can't stand up and walk around. That would be a little weird. Uh, but if you are in a phone screen or even in a Zoom call, stand up. Your energy level will be significantly greater, okay? I'm going to buzz through a couple of these real quick. But ultimately, and, and more importantly, don't try to impress. Try to connect. And we're going to talk a lot more about that, about the art of storytelling and some of those things. First off, smiling, 73% of people say that they automatically trust people that smile, okay? You know, that is a positive way to create a good first impression. When you have the ability to connect, it creates a presence which creates confidence. It gives you confidence because the average person speaks 130 words a minute. The average nervous person, right, someone that may not have confidence walking into an interview, actually speaks at 250 plus words a minute. So which is going to sound a little better in, inside of an interview, right? Someone that is confident, succinctly, and well, um, well spoken. I mean, think about this. Have you ever gone on a job interview, you walk out of it and you go, yeah, man, I really nailed it, man. I knew this was, I got this job, only to find out you didn't get it. Well, the chances are you did what we call, you know, show up and throw up or spray and pray, which means that you get in and you bombard them with all of your skill areas. You bombard them with all the knowledge and you show all the things that you know. But in reality, you never connected with the person that's actually going to be the person that should be hiring you. And, and that is very common in a phone screen initially. If you know you've only got 30 minutes, you want to get out everything you know. It is more important to connect. You're going to have an opportunity to show, to showcase your skills, but it is nothing is more important than connecting with the person. So uh, I think it's, it's a critical piece uh, to, to the interviewing. All right. Now, um, storytelling. Okay. I, I had an old boss that used to tell me, be brief, be brilliant and be gone. And um, that individual, uh, which my wife would certainly attest to, um, I'm not a great storyteller, okay, unless I rehearse and practice what I'm going to talk about, right, because I have the tendency to ramble along if I'm trying to make a point that I have not previously thought through. And so when you are interviewing, it is important that you learn how to tell a story. There's so much data on storytelling. Um, it's becoming more and more popular and prevalent. 
uh, about storytelling and what that does to the brain chemicals and all of those things. And they call it the connection cocktail deals with dopamine, uh, you know, cortisol levels and, and oxytocin, all the things that, that we probably learned back in high school. But it's important to understand that there is a way to frame your story. And, and the STAR technique is very old, right? I mean, I, I can't tell you when I learned this. It was a long time ago. But the STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, and Result, okay? And essentially, what you're trying to do is just frame the story, right? All that great data, all the, the things that you want to talk about when we, when we mention show up and throw up, all those skill areas and great things, great results that you have had in your career can be framed, okay? It's important to understand that and stay within your area of expertise. Don't overdo it, right? Don't become the expert if you're not an expert. Stay within your knowledge base. Stay within using the accomplishments, and that's how you develop your stories, okay? You got to practice, 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 practice. Practice your core message. Understand what are the more common interview questions you're going to get, right? And we'll talk a little bit on the next, uh, on, on the next moment about what are the things that you need to be prepared for, you know, in order to differentiate yourself. And, and if you're going to differentiate yourself, there's, there's a couple things that you can do and to enable yourself to, to uh, really stand out. First off, be personal, not private. There's a difference. Make sure you understand it, right? This question is the question that I have seen so many interviews derail. This is a question that would derail me because I'm, I'm, I'm type A personality, very outgoing. I want to talk. I want to, you know, I want to socialize. Tell me about yourself. First off, focus on you as a person, not, not professional. It's a great opportunity to start the connection. But this is one, if I don't practice, I am absolutely going to get floored on this question. It should be no more than two or three minutes. Um, and, and so it is important to understand that it's not the time to go on. And where I see people derail is they're still talking five, six, seven minutes into the interview. And this is usually one of the first questions. It does not give an opportunity for them to, to really truly get to know you or to connect. So um, that's a very key point I want everyone to make sure that they take. And then the takeaway methodology. There are always going to be things that cause you extreme discomfort. And there's nothing that screams, I don't have confidence, than a level of discomfort, right? And we're trying to give you the ability to be confident right? Which is why we rehearse our stories. We plan for our stories. When we're looking at a face-to-face -face interview, we should have three to five key stories that we're going to use uh, inside of that interview. But the takeaway is maybe it's something you're not proud of. Maybe, maybe you got let go. Um, maybe you had a situation that you blew it and you got fired, right? These are things that are never going to go away. These are going to be questions that you're going to be, um, that you're going to, to, to get in an interview. If you want to shy away or brush through that, that creates yellow flags and red flags. Yellow flags are flags that I say when I'm interviewing, it's like, okay, that's a yellow flag. Caution, let me dig into that more. Or something that may be a red flag where I go, stop. I, there's, I don't want this person, no way. This is not someone that's going to be on our team. And decisions are made that quickly. If there's something that you're not proud of or that is an area of discomfort, plan it practice it, talk through it uh, with your spouse or significant other, with a friend, with a coworker, write it down, write the story out, right? If you can practice your way and then ultimately find a way to deliver that information, right? And move it directly into something positive and create something positive out of it. And that's why I call it the takeaway methodology. You're going to take it away from the interview um, where, where that's not going to be a level of discomfort. And the more you practice your story in regards to that area of discomfort, you start losing that discomfort. Your tension is eased and now you hit it and it turns it into a positive and you move on. If, if an interviewer feels a level of discomfort with you, that is going to allow them to hone in and go, okay, I need to ask more questions around this. If you're very smooth, confident, here's what happened here's what I've learned from, here's, here's what I did in a similar situation since then that proves that I'm over that and that will not happen again, your anxiety levels will be decreased and you'll absolutely come off with a very confident answer with the interviewer going, you know what, let's move on.
Okay, so important to understand that. Now, just if I am preparing for a story, if I'm a leader as an example, let's just use vision and clarity or we can add strategy in that as well. I'm gonna literally take a notebook and I'm gonna write down situation, task, action, and result. So in this particular situation, I would say, okay, the situation was I was a new leader, um, I was in a new leadership role, and my particular job was to uh, uh, execute on an outsourcing plan, okay? The task, I'm gonna start writing this down, was to figure out how to determine the strategy to lower cost, save time, that will allow us to uh, maintain cash in, in order to turn around and scale within the next five years, okay? The action is instead of outsourcing, right? I insourced, I hired uh, lower cost resources, trained them in three months, developed them, um, and then ultimately uh, three of them became uh, top producers, right? Which the result is we grew 600% in three years instead of 200% in five years. So I'll write that out and I'll go, okay, and I'll rehearse it and I'll read through it and I'll do all this. And then I will rehearse it on the story using the STAR methodology. And it'll sound something like, hey, in a previous role, um, I had an opportunity to outsource our operations team. And instead of doing that, right, I decided to insource, not outsource, uh, hired low, lower cost resources, trained them over a three month period, and inevitably uh, three individuals out of that, that group really became top producers that helped us uh, to grow from less than 4 million to over 30 million in three years, which was a 600% increase rather than growing 200% in five years, right? So, so the story, I, I basically said everything that I wrote down on the notebook and inevitably, inevitably what happens is you create this story, they hang on the result portion and you tell it, which is in a very smooth, concise manner right, which will allow them to ask multiple questions, okay? So, so that's a way to use the, the, the STAR technique. And then last but not least, and this is so, 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 so important, okay? Your post-interview follow-up, write a note, okay? Um, send a letter, at a minimal, send an email. But if you're in an interview, please ask them, uh, especially now, some people are working from home, so it might be a little awkward. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to want to get someone, uh, they're, they're not going to want to give their, their home address to a, to a stranger, but at a minimal, send, a, send an email. And when you send that note, reference something specific. As an example, I would reference the conversation that I just shared with you in the, in, in the STAR technique, the story. I would reference, hey, I'm the guy that uh, instead of the five-year plan was able to grow 600% in three years rather than 200% in five years. And so you make a reference point to that. And I think that is something that's very critical uh, so that as, I mean, someone may interview five, six, seven people, maybe more in the first interview, that will allow you to stand out. So um, that's, that's, all, uh, that's all I have right now. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, resumes, we talk about interviewing, these are the most important things. One, understanding how to navigate the ATS world, the world of automation, when it's appropriate to uh, apply and how you make sure that you tailor your resume. And then once you get in the game, which is the interview, which is where you need to hit the home run, be very succinct about what you're, what you're going to say have three to five stories that you are going to live by, that you're gonna make sure that those stories get out in every interview. That's a very critical piece of making sure that you're developing a connection by storytelling and also staying succinct where the person can follow you very easily and more importantly, allow you to be memorable and stand out in your job search. So, uh, Frank? I'm here, hopping back on. Uh... Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you so much. That was, that was great. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. If you're on Facebook, um, type them in there. Um, I think one of the questions we had was, you know, who's somebody that you look up to um, to kind of get to where you are today, to help you get to where you are today? I, I was very fortunate. Um, uh, I'll give you two answers. Um, from a professional standpoint, I was very fortunate. My first boss um, 
at the time wasn't a very nice guy. Um, you know, work, worked me hard, but he trained the heck out of me. Um, he really put time and energy and invested in my growth. And uh, uh, Chris was um, not a tough uh, or not an easy guy to work for. He was a very tough guy, had very high expectations, but that really allowed me to take to the next level. Um, the second actually is my father-in-law. Um, he, he really, from a business mentorship standpoint, um, I was very blessed to have him for, for you know, 10 years or so of, of my career and really allowed me to understand the things about being a leader, being a business person. Uh, and one of the things he always, always uh, stood by was figure out a way to add value to others, right? Um, with everything that you do, right? And, and, I, and I have since translated that, how can I be a blessing to others? And how can my organization, how can we as a team be a blessing to others. And so those, those are the two folks for me that, um, that, uh, jump out right, right out, right out of the gate. Um, somebody asked what, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your company? Yeah. So, uh, Q works group, um, uh, myself and, and a uh, business partner, uh, purchased the organization about three years ago. Um, the organization has been around for 18 years. Uh, we are a talent management company, which really, our primary uh, focus is, is staffing. Our primary focus is helping place candidates. Uh, we have clients that call us and, and say, hey, you know, we need X, and, and we go out and identify candidates uh, that fit those, fit those needs with our clients. We also help with training. Uh, we help them uh, build out job descriptions and help them understand some of the things that we've talked about today uh, and communicating the changes in, in the world today because, uh, Finding talent is not as easy as it used to be, and, um, and and there's a lot of noise in finding talent because of the ATSs, and they get bombarded. I mean, think about it now. There's 40 million unemployed, right? So there's so many people competing for fewer opportunities, and they're getting bombarded, and, and it's really hard for them to see, um, you know, clearly of who's the best talent, and those that can enable themselves by tailoring their individual resume to the particular job description are going to help themselves stand out. So um, that's, that's who we are as an organization and we help candidates with those things and, and uh, help them build out their resumes and help them prepare for interviews. So yeah, good question. Um, you know, there was a lot of good information uh, that you shared today. Um, is there something like, is there a podcast you listen to or is there a favorite book that you have um, that you can recommend for people? Um, for interviewing, I love this book. Um, Amy Cuddy, it's called Presence. Um, it is, she's got a, a 16, 17 minute podcast. I think she did three or four years ago. Um, I would definitely go uh, and, and watch her, her, uh, her TED talk. Um, she's amazing, amazing individual, great story. And the book is phenomenal. The book really helps you understand body language and presence and how to create those things. I mean, a lot of things that I talked about today really come from Amy's research, uh, on people and, and, and how we communicate verbally and non-verbally, uh, because I, I think we all understand the importance of the non-verbal communication and the body language that we have. So um, that would be, when it comes to employment, that would be something that, uh, a book that I highly recommend really for anyone, uh, even if you're secure in your role and, and you're gonna retire where you are, it's a great book to have. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I don't, I don't have any more questions. Um, I know you did, oh wait, just kidding. What type of community engagement do you, um, do you recommend to enhance your skills? Yes. So the great thing is, so I'll, I'll answer this two ways. In today's world, um, you know, it's tough to it's tough to engage in the community because they're trying to keep us home, um, based on on uh, you know the virus. So, but you can still do that within LinkedIn. You can still navigate by uh, joining groups, right? So if if you are, let's say, you're in technology and and you're a you're a software developer. There's hundreds, thousands of groups on LinkedIn that you can start communicating with. And it is important to build um, uh, 
that that online presence when we can't go out to to restaurants or networking events to uh, to, to to network, right? And keep in mind that with that 50% of people get a job through a referral, networking is critical. So um, I would say LinkedIn is a great resource uh, to start doing that. There are tons of Facebook groups now um, that are professionally related. Um, you know, Facebook's really trying to open up the business side of, of Facebook, of the platform. But I think LinkedIn is still the gold standard. So uh, networking uh, with groups there. In normal times, find whatever your interest is. There are tons of meetups, right? I think actually go to meetup.com and, and, and type in your zip code, your local area, and start looking through the groups. I mean, they have every group from if you have an interest in pottery to, uh, you know, learning, learning to fly fish. I mean, there are so many different groups and meetups that you can have. Uh, if you're not involved, you're going to be irrelevant. I mean, in, in, in this day and age, you have to be involved. You have to, you have to be part of the network and part of the community in order to get noticed. So great question. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's a great segue. We, uh, our next webinar, we're taking a couple weeks off. Uh, we're all moving back onto campus and students are moving into campus in the next couple of weeks. So we'll be back um, August 20th and we have a LinkedIn workshop. Um, so if you're interested in building up your LinkedIn, definitely come back. Um, it'll be with uh, two alumni, Ellen Taylor, as well as Alan Ward. Um, so we're very excited to have them on board to, to help people with their LinkedIn profiles. So yeah, I highly recommend um, that 100%. Absolutely. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Michael, for, for presenting for us. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Michael. Um, or if you need to reach out to me, I can definitely get you guys connected. So uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Frank. Be good. Take care, guys. Bye.